Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 94 of Fracking Nightmare, which is being broadcast from the UK Column Studios in Plymouth on the evening of Monday, 3rd of October, 2016. Now, this is potentially a catalytic week for the unconventional gas industry in the UK, because the Conservative Party conference is going on right now as we speak, and will run through until Wednesday. And Saeed Yavid has let it be known that on Wednesday afternoon, probably in the closing stages of the Conservative Party conference, he will announce the government decision regarding Quadrilla's appeal against the Lancashire County Council decision to reject their application to establish two wells to drill and frack on the Fylde Peninsula. And uh, Francis Egan, um, this is either uh, hubris or he's uh, been given the nod, but at uh, the weekend he said uh, that he was confident of fracking to get a go-ahead from Saeed Javid. And uh, in the um, uh, article, this is from the Daily Telegraph actually, Emily Gosden, the energy editor, says, Quadrilla is confident that the government will this week approve its plans to frack in Lancashire in a pivotal moment for the UK shale gas industry. And these are comments attributed to Francis Egan, the chief executive of Quadrilla. Saeed Yabid, the community secretary, is expected to announce on Thursday whether he will overrule local councillors and grant the company permission to frack at two sites between Blackpool and Preston. In a make or break week for UK frackers, councillors in Nottinghamshire will also vote on Wednesday on whether to open up a new exploration front in the East Midlands, this is at Misson Springs, by approving proposed drilling by IGAS. So, needless to say, obviously, the industry is confident that the government will overturn the, uh, the Lancashire County Council decision. And um, I think it's a pretty safe bet. I'd love to be wrong, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that uh, Saeed Javid will announce that the Lancashire County Council decision at Rossica, i.e. to reject the application, will be upheld. But the application to drill and frack at Preston New Road will be overturned. And from that point forward, obviously, uh, Lancashire has a, a massive fight on its hands. Now, I think it's going to be Wednesday rather than Thursday, because Wednesday is the last day of the Tory party conference. And I think they'll want to uh, go out with the proverbial bang, uh, maybe literally and uh, metaphorically. Well, I guess I guess are looking to uh, drill at Misson Springs. And I guess uh, last week released their half yearly report. And one has to say it's not a pretty picture. And this is a summary, a financial summary. And you can see their uh, revenues are down significantly, down from 17.6 uh, to 12.1 million. But here's the most significant um, numbers. Their loss after tax was 25.2 million pounds. That's uh, increase of uh, the losses from 19.3 million in the same six month period last year. Well, here's another figure that uh, should have everybody sitting up and taking note. IGAS have a net debt of 83.5 million. So once again, this uh, shows the lie associated with the British government announcement that uh, local communities affected by the unconventional gas industry could receive up to 10 million pounds from profits. Well, here's the proof that there wouldn't be any profit anytime soon. And in that report, uh, the uh, IGAS uh, management state, the ability of the group to operate as a going concern is dependent upon the continued availability of future cash flows and the bonds not becoming repayable earlier than their stated maturity date, which in turn is subject to the holders of the bonds not exercising their rights to early repayment, which they would be entitled to do if the group did not continue to imply with its bond covenants. In response to the low oil price, the board implemented a series of cost-saving initiatives during 2015 that materially reduced both operating costs 
and um, general administrative spending. During the current period, the focus on reducing costs and maintaining adequate liquidity has continued. Now, let me paraphrase that for you. Um, I guess are in deep doo-doo. That's a technical term. And the bottom line is that the likelihood of iGas actually getting out of this mire anytime soon is slim to none. And there's a good possibility that Nottinghamshire County Council will um, maybe uh, take note of Saeed Javid's announcement um, because if uh, he overturns the decision uh, against Lancashire, there is obviously the potential for him to overturn the decision in Nottingham. But uh, in Misson, this was the survey that was conducted amongst the community and um, of, and of the uh, responses sent into Nottinghamshire County Council, uh, there were 2,624 responses against the application and six in favour. That's 99.8% basically against the application to drill and frack at Misson Springs. Well, the IGAS uh, shareholders, of course, uh, should have listened to what the advice that we were putting out some uh, two years ago when we were encouraging them to sell. But of course, hubris, no, no, they're going to make their fortune. This time next year, we'll be millionaires. Uh, I don't think so. Well, the IGAS stock of course, continues to, to wallow. It's now sitting at around about 7.5% of its peak uh, in January of 2013. Um, I mean, obviously, if the uh, Nottinghamshire decision and Saeed Javid overturns the Lancashire decision, then the likelihood is that, uh, you know, some more mud punters will come in thinking that they can make out like bandits. But... Uh, uh, basically, their money will go the same way as that of the investors over the past uh, nearly three years. Um, might as well throw it down the proverbial black hole. Meanwhile, of course, the price of oil, which uh, impacts directly on the price of gas, um, may now settle somewhere around around about the 50 buck mark. And this is because the OPEC countries are beginning to find the level at which the unconventional gas industry is not particularly viable. And uh, so consequently, they'll probably try and maximize their uh, potential return by keeping the market share as high as they possibly can um, and also keeping the price as high as they possibly can without giving any incentive for new unconventional projects to become established. So over the last... Um, uh, what is it now? Three years here, we can see that the price of oil has gone from its high of 114 uh, down to the 4860. This is still the point at which unconventional gas exploitation is considered to be viable, particularly in the UK. Some US operators claim that they've got their cost down to around about the 35, 40 buck mark. Um, but in the UK, the likelihood of them being able to achieve anything below 75 bucks any time in the foreseeable future is slim to none. So the reality is, of course, that there is a number of people who draw their salaries from these companies and uh, they want to keep drawing their salary. And the fact that the company digs a deeper and deeper black hole, financial black hole, that is, um, is really of no concern to them because they will still have the money going into the bank and they will probably walk away with a healthy severance package, uh, which will be paid for by the debtors, uh, sorry, the uh, their creditors and the uh, bondholders. So if I was an iGas bondholder, yes, I think I'd be watching the situation very closely. So in a week, which is going to be catalytic, for the UK unconventional gas industry, and of course, for the fracking awareness campaign, it's absolutely crucial that we continue to take note of the experiences of those who have had to live with this insidious industry for the past decade plus. Now, earlier this year, back in March, I had as my guest, uh, Helen Bender, and Helen is the daughter of George Bender, who sadly um, took his own life in mid-October uh, of 2015. So coming up to the anniversary of uh, that event, 
Um, and of course, that event was triggered by George literally reaching the end of his tether in having to deal with this industry for the past decade. Now, Helen recognizes the significance of this week in terms of uh, you know, what uh, unfolds in the UK and has agreed to come back and join us tonight on Fracking Nightmare. Now it's um, a little after six o'clock on Tuesday morning uh, out there in um, southern Queensland, just outside uh, Chinchilla. So Helen, thank you so much for getting up early at the crack of dawn and uh, joining us again on Fracking Nightmare. I know this is going to be a very tough month for you, um, but uh, you know your uh, experiences are extremely important and may just get a few more people to actually get off the fence and understand what it is that uh, the industry is attempting to unleash on a, a still largely unsuspecting percentage of the UK population. Good evening in um, morning here, but evening there. Um, nice to be back, nice to be asked to come back. And yes, October, October's here. And, 12 and months, it's... Um, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure in some ways that 12 months has uh, dragged by and in other ways I'm sure it's uh, flown by. We, yeah. yeah, you know, sorry. Oh, no, carry on, carry on. Oh, I was just going to say, like... Um, you know, in reflecting of the, of the last 12 months, you know, um, in March when you spoke to me, I, I could probably say I was doing okay, you know. I was I was feeling like I was dealing with things. Um, but then if you'd asked me, you know, if you were speaking to me, say, in June, June I, I would, would have said that oh, I was probably pretty close to the edge. Um, you know, it's just the amount of stress that, that, that you know, started to, to build up. Um, and if you probably spoke to me about a month or so ago, you know, I, I probably wouldn't know what to how to sort of respond. You know, how are you going? I, I wouldn't have known. And you know, it's just amazing how the how the brain anatomy deals with the, the stress loads. Um, and I think I think I need to probably just spend a little bit of a moment here because someone, no doubt, in the UK will find themselves in a very similar position as I did, which you know, I was just sort of flung into this position out, out of complete tragedy. Um, but people would say to me, you know, look after yourself, but I had no idea what that really meant. Um, I think in the last few weeks, so many veils have actually lifted for me. And one thing that I, I, I didn't realise when you find yourself, um, for a better term, maybe like a bit of a leader in such a movement, you're, you find yourself at the end of dirty politics. And um, that's really hard to handle. And this is not dirty politics from the people that you'd expect, like your politicians or the pro-gas people. These are, this is the dirty politics that happen with um, people who you think are on the same side. And, you know, you're, you're both aiming or, you know, as a collectively you're aiming for that bigger picture. And people will use you. And um, that is probably the hardest thing to take. Um, and But when you understand the dirty politics, you know, veils are lifted and, and I'd actually have to say I found myself caught in a, a fight mode, you know, the fight and flight mode. Um, so I've, I've realised that I'd been stuck in a fight mode. So it wouldn't matter if, you know, the little girl guide came to the door and tried to, you know, sell me a box of $5 cookies. So I'd probably try and fight her because that's sort of when you're in this movement, you, you're caught in this fight mode and you really need to look after yourself in that. You really under, have to understand how to take the time away to look after yourself. So... For, for anybody who finds themselves in a situation like this, you know, keep make sure you keep this movement in a box and, and, and put a lid on it and only lift that lid when you have to deal with things. Otherwise, yeah, you'll find yourself very, very quickly caught in a situation like I did. So in the last month or so, I've, um, yeah, I've actually had to take a step away and, and basically do what I should have been doing all the time, which was look after myself. So you know, I, right I, now I can say I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> Well, no, that's great. That's, that's, that's great, and I, I mean, I appreciate it. it's a real emotional roller coaster for you, and uh, that's uh, you know, probably not going to get any easier in the uh, over the next few weeks. But I mean, after the events of last October, um, you you gave up your life in Brisbane, and effectively came back to the uh, to the farm, you know, to to help out. Yeah. Um, 
when you came back to the farm, how much, how much awareness had you had prior to the magnitude of the devastation that uh, your, your mum and dad had had to be dealing with? Oh, no, I've always been involved for like the 10 years. Um, it's just that I'd been in Brisbane or, or in, it, yeah, it pretty much started when I came back from Perth. Um, so I've always been involved. I guess it was the fact that when you're in Brisbane, you're, you're a little bit disconnected from, um, you know, I, I, I either get only told um, what they wanted to tell me or, you know, so many times I'd get the phone calls or, or, or an email saying, can you, can you, uh, you know, research this or can you find out more about that? Um, can you have a read of this plan? Can you tell us what you think? Um, for people who don't know, I've got a, an engineering sort of construction management background. So um, I guess I, I was probably the one that Dad turned to first to ask for any, you know, advice or information. But, look, Dad did most of it himself. He really did. He researched. He, he did his own research. Um, pretty much he used his common sense. Um, yeah, so, you know, he knew. He, he, he fought for the water mostly. He knew what was going to happen to our underground water. That was his biggest fight. Um, I think that's because he knew, he understood that. You, know, you can't just take unlimited amount of brown water without causing some, some kind of damage. Um, so he was saying that well before the, uh, the actual underground cumulative impact report came out in 2012 that there was going to be some serious damage to the, to the Great Artesian Basin, and he was right. And there was a lot of people who, um, who said he didn't know what he was talking about. And when, when it all came out, they, some of them came back and apologised. Some most didn't. Um, but that's ego and pride. Um, so, yeah, I, I I kind of understood what we were facing. Um, when I first came back, though, I mean, I, I never thought that in, you know, nearly 12 months on I'd still be here, and I think I'm in my last uh, last couple of weeks probably here. I think I'll be, I will be heading back to Brisbane shortly. And um, But my, my primary... primary um, you know, task first up was to organise all of our, cor like, the correspondence. And in doing so, I, I ended up with, I think it's it's around about 22 or 23 folders full of um, letters, correspondence. Um, so I've, yeah, it, it, it took a few months to get all that sorted. Um, you know, 8,000 emails. So I didn't print all of them out. I just printed out the ones that were pertinent to keep um so yeah there was a lot a lot to go through and then I've um I've put all that into a spreadsheet actually so I pretty much have a number on each correspondence so as I can quickly find things I can and in, 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 in essence when you look at that spreadsheet you can see how much um the volume of information that one person had to deal with because um, across all the companies and then per month you could see the amount of correspondence that was coming through from all the gas companies um, government departments, and it's phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, it starts off not so bad, but, yeah, by the, in these last couple of years, it's, it's phenomenal, phenomenal amount of information. Well, I, I guess that, you know, that, that probably gave you some, um, well, it did give you some insight as to sort of how much stress and pressure your, your dad was uh, actually absorbing and, and taking on board. Mm. And, and, of course, the, the industry and the governments rely on either people just trying to contest their policies on an individual basis, or mm -hmm. they want the other extreme, which is to be dealing with a single NGO. And what they don't seem to be able to be able to deal with is communities coming together and sort of bringing their combined expertise. And you know, in the UK, we have the advantage, obviously, of population density. You know, the UK mm. is one seventh the size of Queensland, um, and we have a population that's close on four times the size of the Australian continent. So we, we have that population density. Um, but in that in this fight, I mean, I, we know your dad had the support of like the monks and the Jenkins, but I mean, from my visits to uh, Southern Queensland, I'm also well aware that the industry was um, 
uh, more than able to buy people's silence with um, uh, either overt payments um, with a contract that required uh, them to sign a confidentiality clause um, or um, not so overt payments, which still had the same effect of buying their silence. So, I mean, effectively, they divided the community. And, and is this still the case? I mean, you know, the evidence in southern Queensland for the magnitude of the devastation is is undeniable to all except the most extreme sufferers of cognitive dissonance. Yet is the community there still divided as to whether coal seam gas is, has been um, uh, an asset for the state? Yeah, it's um, uh, still a bit of a white elephant in the room, um, especially around Chinchilla. Uh, I, I think I think right now there's a few people who are starting to realise that it's not so good. But this has only come about because mostly I would say the crime in and, and the drugs that are in Chinchilla now. Um, you know, you've got drugs being, well, it's in the primary school. That's where it's been sold. Um, the primary school ch children and the high school students are, are, are selling the drugs. And these aren't just, um, these, these, are, these are hard drugs that are being sold. So, um, and then obviously, of course, uh, you know, in terms of the rentals, um, there's so many em empty homes in Chinchilla, um, empty, empty shops. And then, of course, you've got at the start when when it was in the boom, a lot of people had to move away because they couldn't afford the rent. So none of them have ever come back. So you know, I think I think the community realised their mistakes. They realised, oh, this you know five thousand dollar check to the junior rugby league team wasn't worth it. But you know, they they took it with open hands. And you know, I've come back to that pride and ego. A lot of people are uh, would prefer to to look after that than actually admit the truth of, you know, Chinchilla is a, it's a town that I don't even recognise. Um, it's a town that I don't even like to go in. In fact, you know, you know, in 12 months that I've been here, I've probably been in, into Chinchilla a handful of times. I, I avoid it. I don't like it. Um, I don't know anybody. The street is empty. Um, it's not the town that I grew up in when, you know, I used to, beg if I could go to town because it, it used to be a fun place. You used to go up the main street, you used to see so many people that you knew. Um, now now you wouldn't you wouldn't know. You, it's it's an empty, deserted town. Um, you know, when they brought KFC and McDonald's to town, you know, the industry claimed that it was bringing culture to Chinchilla. I mean, hello? <laughs> what culture? But, um, yeah, so a, a lot of... A lot of I mean, look, look there, there are a few families in Chinchilla who obviously did very well out of it. Fortunately, they either had like a bit of a civil um, sort of contracting type um, business beforehand, so they were able to expand. Um, you know, but there's a lot of businesses who expanded too fast, thought it was going to be a 30-year boom, um, and now have you know they've they've, they've fallen over. There's a lot of um, also local businesses and. This is probably not so much Chinchilla, probably more uh, maybe out Roma way with Santos. Um, Santos haven't paid them. So these family businesses are now, you know, $6 million in debt and they've, they've gone under and now they're left with this huge, huge debt that they're trying to, um, yeah, trying to recover from. Um, I guess on the water side of things, um, the Condamine River, I think people have only now just, I mean, I've started putting up the post there about the, the Condamine River looking like this murky, milky blue colour. And finally people are going, oh, have a look at the colour of the water. And it's like, well, what have you been doing for so long? Um, so you're really going to have to think that, you know, has the government and the industry really poisoned the minds um, of the community? Um, but I still feel that it's a white elephant in the room. I really do. Um People know, but no one will talk properly. No one will openly admit how bad this really is unless you're directly in the path of it. Well, I, I guess as well that, uh, I mean, you've got the likes of yourselves, the Jenkins, the monks. I mean, these are the people I mentioned because they're the ones that are comfortable uh, with their names being mentioned. I mean, a number of people that I met. Hey, when... Ian, can I, can I just interrupt? Go on. I'm just going to have to check my power. I'm just going to have to check my power.
Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. You, can you, you just go to a, a video? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Take your time. We're going to okay, we're going to play your, your video then. No worries. We can okay, right, we can I'll come we back can adapt. <laughs> okay. Um right. Yeah, Helen's in the uh, in the, obviously on the farm and um, needs to uh, ensure that uh, the generators are rolling to give the power to continue talking with us. Well, Helen has been working with one of her neighbors, uh, John Reed Carew. And uh, they put together a short uh, film um, called The Sacrifice Zone. And uh, the, the film runs for about nine minutes. And we're going to take a look at this because then we're going to move on to the discussion with Helen about the impact on the farming business. Now, some of the footage uh, in this uh, video is you know, really quite disturbing. And um, it, you know, one of the reasons that uh, uh, the pigs um, obviously suffer the impacts, particularly of toxic gases first, uh, are because they spend most of their time with their snouts on the ground. And as many of the uh, toxic gases are heavier than air, then obviously they, they sink down to ground level and the pigs are the first to pick it up. They're like the canary um, in this situation. So take a look at this. And when we come back, uh, then we'll get Helen to, um, talk us through the experiences of dealing with pigs that are suffering the effects of the contamination from the unconventional gas industry. There's some things there that are happening that I've never seen happen before. Can you give us an example? Well, you go down to feed the pigs in the morning, come back half an hour later, here they are gasping for breath. And they just go like that. Half of it is, exactly half of it. Thursday, the 28th of July, 2016. Massive flowering. Come out there and watch these flares. What's coming of these flares? The government won't tell us. The industry won't tell us. Is this fair? Look at it. This is suffering. Is it the CSG water that QGC is dumping into the Condamine River that is making these pigs sick? Or is it the gas flowering? You know, the whole neurological nervous system shot to pieces. I don't know, I don't know what to say about this. I want answers, that's what I want. I received this letter from the Department of Natural Resources and Mines, undated, mind you, but received on an email dated the 22nd of June, 2016. And it is signed by James Patel, Director General. In this letter, he answers a question which I asked, what air quality do we need to safely rear animals in an intensive environment, being such as a piggery, because that is at one of our food sources. And under this heading of air quality and intensive animal rearing, it's with regards to your comments concerning intensive animal rearing, EHP, Environment Heritage Protection, has informed me that, there, that they are not aware of air quality regulations or guidelines that specifically apply to intensive animal rearing, such as a piggery. Further on, they say over on this particular page, we have spoken to the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and they have confirmed that there are no specific guidelines related, related to um, intensive animal rearing or piggeries. So they've allowed this CSG industry into prime agriculture land, into a primary industry where we have had a piggery here since 1940 and they can't tell us how, how we can safely breed pigs. This or is one of the hundreds of sick pigs that we've had since unconventional gas mining has hit our area. Um, yeah, it impacts their nervous system. Massive gas flaring last night. And when I say last night massive, I mean oh, 
the whole southern from east to west was flaring and we lost one of these yesterday and obviously we're going to lose this one but this is coexistence this is what the government are going to want your children to be like. This is also what the government probably don't want you to see. This is the truth about the gas industry. when we have, or we might, like, like the Link Energy Stink, we lost one pig every day for three days. Just drop dead. You need, I took videos of it so you can see them gasping for breath and the way that they're sitting. It's interesting, have you ever seen a pig give another pig mouth to mouth? Yeah, I've got that on video. A pig giving another pig mouth to mouth. I understand there's a whole range of issues in the area with CSG, okay? I'm, I'm not dumb. I know that. I live in Dolby, so I'm aware of what's going on. But I personally can't do much about CSG. But I'm working, I work in the area of animal health, animal welfare. That's the area I work in. Now, if I can get some answers from you in regard to the health and disease and deaths in the pigs, I need to get background information. I need to know something about the piggery, who, who manages it, who runs it, how big it is. I'm now at home because my father's no longer here and I'm assisting my mother. Well, George, who you need to speak to is George Bender. He managed that. The answers, the pigs, you go down, they are gasping for breath. You have, all this stuff happens in association with a link energy stink or gas flaring events. There are the connections. Or you have water going into the condom mine from, from the RO plants that has now come back to where we pump from and you can't tell us if that water's safe for our animals to drink. Well, we I don't can't know. Do well, I, I don't do know. I can't. It is an environmental stress that is causing this issue. Now, what you see today with our pigs isn't a disease because if it was a disease, it would be across the entire piggery, but it doesn't work like that. It so is- So are you saying it's only part of the piggery that's affected? I'm saying it could only be one. It could be one pig in one pen. It could be another pig in a different pen. There's no correlation. The only okay. correlation between any of it is the environment and the changes in the environment from after that link stink. And, they and you can pick it, well, yeah. Of course they died. Um, then you had the neurological issue. So we lost three pigs in in three days, okay. one each. Now, yep. this is not a disease. This is an environmental issue. So yep. the question is, will your department investigate the environmental changes that are causing this issue onto the on like on our pigs? It's an environmental issue. No, I think the answer is no, isn't it? Oh God, I can't tell you what our department's gonna do. Earlier this morning, I showed you the sick, sick pigs. And 
clearly the Queensland government's going to turn that back on us and make it our problem. So I thought I'd come out to the, some of the gas fields and see what what was happening today. And look, this is what we've got happening today. And at the same time as we've got pigs dying, we've got birds falling out of the sky, landing dead on our lawn, there for us to find. That's not normal. So, in summary, it's as simple as this. The young conventional gas industry, UCG, CSG, classify this area, Hopelands, Chinchilla, as the sacrifice zone. That means every man, woman, child, baby, animal is expendable. This is a dog that used to wake mum and dad up when the Link Energy smell um, used to come through in the mornings. Oh, my thanks to John Reed Carew and to Helen for uh, letting us um, show that video. And I say we will put a link on the YouTube information so that people can just go straight to that video. Now, you know, the title is Sacrifice Zone. People say, oh, you know, that, that, that's scaremongering, that's, uh, you know, outrageous. There's no evidence to uh, support that statement. And yet, you know, what we've just seen and, and your experiences for the past decade and certainly, you know, very much for the past uh, uh, 12 months, Helen, um, I don't think there's any other term that really could be used to describe it. It's probably an understatement, Ian, to be honest. Um... You know, in terms of the health impacts on on our livestock, it started in 2010, and and I'd say the trigger in 2010 was the uh, Link Energy underground coal gasification. Um, that's when we. I think we've just uh, frozen on Helen there. Let's just see if we can uh, get her back in a second. But this is what she is referring to here. This is the um, the underground coal gasification. We started. Ah, oh, there we Helen. Detecting the Helen. Helen. We... Uh, sorry, we lost. Yeah? We lost we you. Me? No, we lost you there. The line. Yep. The line froze for a couple of minutes. So anything that you said yep. for the last two minutes, we didn't actually catch. So no, you, that's you, fine. We, we, I we caught, talking. <laughs> we said we uh, we got as far as that uh, the problem with the pig started in 2010 with um, the uh, the link stink. Yes, the link stink. So um, 2010, um, the link stink, which is um, that little dog at the at the end of the the video, would pretty much wake mum and dad up early in the morning. They used to initially they thought it was oh she needs to go to the toilet because she sleeps inside. But um, as soon as you'd get outside, you'd, you'd, you'd have this smell. Um, it's very much a hydrocarbon type burning oil. And um, yeah, so um, pretty much as soon as you, any days you'd get that, that odor, um, you go down the piggery and you'd, you'd have the impacts on the pigs. So they'd either be gasping, well, they'd either be dead um, or they'd be gasping for breath. Or they just start to sort of waste away and and, and just look start looking really sick. Well, you sent um, you sent me through so a few photo you sent me through a few photographs. Maybe you can uh, just talk yep. us through you know, what's going on with the uh, the okay. pigs in these photographs. Okay, well that's basically a litter that was stillborn. Um, now, I'll, something that I cut out of that video um, that you just watched was um, the week. The two weeks prior to that gas flaring, um, we had uh, two weeks where we lost, had significant stillbirth loss as, as well. Um, I I think from memory it's about 40. We lost 40 piglets across five sours. So we had litters where we lost, you know, seven, six, eight, nine, and that's not normal. And what I worked out, it wasn't until maybe the second or the third sour that had, you know, enormous loss of stillbirths um, that I, I went back to the book and I looked at when they were mated and where they were in their just um, the gestation period and I then studied on the pig embryo development and what I found was that these sours were just past their 30-day um, gestation period 
and any issues in the the sow in their pregnancy after day 30, the sow is unable to absorb the embryo, whereas prior to day 30, because um, none of the bones and um, all that haven't yet calcified, they're still soft tissue, pigs and sows actually, if there's a problem, they will absorb the embryo to avoid stillbirths. So all these sours happen to be around this 30-day gestation period of when we had the last um, lynx stink odour that occurred in May. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, if the government, if the Queensland government want to say that whatever this issue is for lynx is, and they're not obviously admitting to how dangerous it is, um, it's dangerous enough to kill. Now, there's women here who can't fall pregnant and there's women here who have had a lot of miscarriages and now we've got pigs that have had, obviously, huge stillbirths and um, even aborting. Um, we've had a sow just recently abort and we had sows, obviously, since 2010 aborting and we, we've we never had that before. And, um, and just to, put, just know, to uh, pick up on a point here, I mean, I think we've, we've discussed this before, but the... The DNA of DNA. a pig is very, very similar to that of a human. Very. Um, in fact, um, in my Senate inquiry, I actually wrote it in a, in a sense that we are so closely linked with the DNA to a pig that it's actually easier to describe our differences than to go through the long list of, um, of our similarities. So um, in terms of our differences, you're pretty much looking at physical appearances. They've got bigger ears and they'll actually have a physical tail and they've actually got hooves instead of toes. So, you know, um, in terms of the entire internal, the way the, where the organs are, how the organs work, um, the way they mother, we're, we're identical. So consequently, um, mm. anything that happens to a pig, like I said, I mean, the major difference, of course, is that they're generally um, breathing air literally at ground level, whereas we're, uh, you know, a few feet above it. So any yeah, toxin, any um, heavier than air toxins are going to hit them first. Yeah, and that's actually something else that we, we've noticed is that um, during the winter months, so when, because um, the head, uh, the air density is um, heavier, um, that's when we will have more sick pigs than during the summer when the air is much lighter and, and, and we must have the wind direction off the gas field or the wind coming um, across from Link Energy. So we must have the, that, um, you know, those weather conditions as well. So, you know, um, you know, we only get these sick pigs when we have the odour or there's gas flaring. Um, they're the only times we see them. So I don't, I, you know, ha, what, what are we supposed to say? We've had autopsies done. We've had numerous autopsies done. And we can't find a disease like an agricultural swine disease. Um, uh, one issue could be, you know, what we have been told is um, it's a heart attack. And whatever's killing them will kill humans. So but just a bit, a bit unusual in terms of the uh, the volume of um, uh, of stillborn pigs, because as you said, that's a unique event almost, and and certainly the uh, the number of adult losses that you've had has been high, far greater than normal. Well, well, you'd probably we we probably would never even lose. I mean, after once they're born, unless you know. The, Power happens to lie on one or whatever. You, you, we never really lost any, um, unless a snake got in. You, you, you could see that, but you know, in 2010, 11, 12, um, you know, the height of the lynx stink, we were losing maybe five wiener pigs um, easily a week. And I think I sent you a photo there of um, a group of pigs in a in like a trolley, and, and they were gasping. Not that one, but that's you can see the rash and and the eyes. That one, that's the one. Um, no, back. No, they're back just more stillborn. Says back one, thanks. Yeah, those ones. So we were losing like five of them um, a, a week, and you can see them the way they sit on their their legs, and they're just gasping for breath. Um, that's what we we would see. You you see them, you know, in three days they'd easily they'd, they'd be dead. And I know I had a few comments there saying, "Oh, this is really cruel. You know, you need to put them out of their misery." Well. Oh, looks like we got a, a, a breach again. 
in the line you know, if I was a conspiracy theorist, my goodness. Well, let's go back to um, uh, the graphic that I was showing earlier because this is, this is the magnitude of the damage caused by Link Energy. Now, this was a 13-year experiment and this is underground coal gasification, which is effectively setting the coal seams alight and then uh, extracting the gases and using uh, the hot gases to power turbines. And the area that has been contaminated as a result of uh, this experiment is estimated to be some 320 square kilometers. And uh, you know, in the previous um, uh, fracking nightmare where we were speaking with Helen, uh, she was explaining that they couldn't bury the pigs any deeper than six feet. In fact, they were forbidden to dig any deeper than six feet down into the soil because of the contamination of the area. Link Energy <coughs> have effectively um, been shut down, of course, and uh, now is the ongoing uh, legal battles, one to obviously deal with the reparations, and uh, then two to um, potentially look at uh, compensation for those affected. But, uh, you know, the, in the normal scheme of things, that's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Helen, hi, you're back with us. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. That's all right. No worries. Yeah. I mean, these things... Maybe it's QGC in origin. <laughs> yeah, these things happen. Um, okay, we were talking about the, the pigs. Let's uh, go back here, because I think this this is... Um, you're looking at the eyes here, aren't you? Ah, uh, yes. So, um, with those eyes, um, we, I mean, essentially, so many pigs would get these eye irritations. And that's no different to what people here are experiencing in the gas fields themselves. Um, I know myself, if I go into the gas fields, immediately my eyes are tired and itchy and, you know, you, uh, you, you just basically want to scratch your eyeballs. But we'd, we'd get all these pigs with eye irritation. So that's clearly something to do with the air quality that we're – and we've never had that before either. Um, so I don't know if this is QGC or if it's a link issue. Um, but yeah, eye irritations. And, and the throat, Many I mean, I can remember, you know, when I was out with, uh, Brian and David and, uh, particularly whenever we were around the high point vents, uh, and if we were standing in any way mm -hmm. downwind, then it didn't take long for the cotton mouth to kick in and the throat to go dry. Alex, yes. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now. Uh, you know, yeah. In the UK, <clears throat> obviously, it's still referred to by the um, protagonists for the industry as a novel industry, which is, you know, just an absurdity. You know, they, they, they try and claim that, uh, you know, because it's never been done before in the UK, it's novel. And of course, this is an attempt to actually try to prevent people from doing their own research and actually taking a look at what has occurred elsewhere in the world. And as you heard, you know, in the opening part of the program, this is a catalytic week for the UK. The government is about to announce, um, uh, probably announce permission for Quadrilla to frack uh, a well in, um, in the Fylde. And uh, Nottinghamshire County Council are probably gonna give permission because they're scared of what might happen if they don't. Uh, probably going to give permission for iGas to drill. What would your counsel be to people who live in these communities that still think that those people who are trying to uh, um, prevent this from happening are just scaremongers or environmental Nazis or, or any other sort of derogatory term that is used by the media to demonise us? Well... <laughs> Obviously, research. I mean, for Queensland, as far as I can establish, is that that the industry comes into areas under these veils of silence. Um, they'll do it as quickly as possible, and they'll make sure nobody knows exactly what's going on. Um, in terms of fracking, I know there's a fracking chemical that they use that can cause uh, chemical um, pneumonia. Um, so if there's anybody... Um, animals, uh, who, who knows what what health impacts are going to come from from the fracking. But obviously research. Um, you know, we've got an internet. Uh, it doesn't take much now to 
to seriously research. And um, I honestly, I mean, the sacrifice zone basically it's an understatement of what the true impacts really are because I don't think Queensland have e- has even started to see the real impacts of what damage has been done in the last 10 years. Um, the environment works so slowly. We, we, we won't see it until it's far too late. But the sacrifice zone plus Brian Monk's, you know, wonderful comment of you don't live in a gas field, you die in one. Um, hand in hand, that's like a, a hand in a glove. Um, it will be. It will be death, and that's pretty much the future for Queensland and especially the Surat Basin. Um, we this or well, last week um, there was approval to now uh, basically encapsulate it as landfill the, the salt and the brine, and you know the location of which they've they've chosen the soil quality there is so poor, poor that it won't hold. Um, you can't even build a dam and they're going to now encapsulate and landfill all this toxic, carcinogenic, heavy metals um, that's going to flow straight into a creek that will flow into the condomine. Um, it's just, it, you know, in terms of the, the, the true impacts, we won't know. We won't know for another 30, 40 years. I mean, the irony is, the, the irony is if... Um... If anybody told you that uh, somebody was going to come into an area and, uh, and effectively poison your soil and poison your water, then, you know, there would be absolute uproar. But because it's the gas industry and because it's supported by the government, everyone says, oh, that's OK. So the effect is exactly the same or potentially worse even because they're, they're a, it's not a one-off event. It, it's, a, it's a multiple event every day of every week of every month for many, many years. And, and, and basically, once it started, there doesn't seem to be yes. too much opportunity to shut it down. No, no. Um, your only opportunity or your best opportunity is at the start. Um, here in Queensland, I mean, look, we've got here in Victoria that's banned, that's going to ban um, onshore unconventional gas mining. Um, Although I'd like to see that ban protected by a, a people's referendum that, you know, it can't be changed by the next change of government. But ultimately the Premier there made the decision to ban it based on the information that came out of Queensland saying that it was too great of a risk to the agricultural industry. Well, how can it be too risky for one state and safe for another? It, it, those things just don't make sense. And, um, you know... It has to be done at the start. The, the industry will use every bit of loophole silencing mechanisms to proceed. Um, they will, you know, for, for Queensland, for me right here, it's like, well, if you've actually got absolutely nothing to hide, why don't you do the proper testing? Why, why when you go and do air quality monitoring on a gas field, you turn off all the gas wells and then do the monitoring? Why do you have why can why can the monitoring not be done with the gas fields, um, you know, turned on? What's there to hide? I thought there was nothing to hide, but yet there seems to be so much to hide. Um, you know, um, in, in in terms of the week where we had that gas flaring, where we had those sick pigs in that video, and and I I, I couldn't even explain to you what the southern sky looked like. It, it was red raw from east to west. Um, and, you know, I went back to the government because of the sick pigs and said, well, I want to know every well that was flaring. They said to me that they have no legislative power to obtain that information from the gas company. So it was like, well, what's the point of having a government? If you have no ability to obtain information out of the corporations, well, you know, for well, Queensland, it is just it is it is a speeding truck. Yeah, and, and obviously down the uh, highway. Yeah, the environment agency, but the environment agency or environment protection agency, whatever the country calls them, and uh, people think that they're there to actually protect the environment, but of course they're not. <laughs> they're there to provide a, a medium by which the corporations can actually get in to do what they want to do. 
um, but convince the yeah. gullible public that there's actually uh, uh, some kind of regulatory body monitoring them when there isn't at all. And, and you made well, a... Go yeah. On. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and, and that Peter Leggett that, um, that called me from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, you know, he's saying that he was concerned about the welfare and the health of the pigs. And, I, and, and the conversation I was having to him was, well, are you going to look at the health, I mean, the, the environmental side of things and, and the health impacts on the pigs? And he refused. He would not and will not consider. And I said to him, well, you won't come and, and inspect the piggery unless you also include the environmental um, changes. And he wouldn't, you know, that's part of the conversation. I mean, the conversation, I've had a number of conversations with him and I cannot get him to get, um, to even look at the environment. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, what I think the Queensland government will want to do is to come out here, con, you know, basically condemn the, the piggery, saying that it's something in the piggery, it must be shut down. And that would only, and that's just to assist the, 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 the you know, the industry because without the pigs you can't see you can't immediately see the impacts, the health impacts. So it would be in the Queensland government's best interest to shut us down. You know, well, so they're the things I'm fighting. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think um, you know, John John Jenkin made the same observation when I was with him that you know the government wouldn't come out and test uh, because they didn't want to test mm. because they knew damn well that the results that they would get would not be what they want, and they would either have to. Uh, you know, fudge the results or not publish the results, um, whereas actually just not testing was much easier to deal with. That's exactly right, Ian. And that's, um, you know, a report that came to me just recently on the Argyle gas field. Um, you know, I know that that gas field's been shut down. And here they did air monitoring tests on this gas field that's not even turned on. And the government's going, hey, but it, everything's okay. Well, of course it is. It's turned off. You know, so, you know, um, for the UK, you, I, I just say you do everything that you can possibly do um, that's in your capable means and even if you have to go and become somehow a superhero, do whatever you have to do to, to, stop, um, to stop this industry. Um, if there's anything that the pig video um, can hopefully convince people who are sitting on the fence that maybe there is something that's more sinister behind this industry. Um, I only hope so. Um, it's at our loss and, it's, you know, it was a very extremely stressful month that July, you know, the, with the, the huge volumes of stillbirths, um, then the flaring and the sick pigs. I mean, that was pretty much um, my month of July was just full of death here on, on the farm. So... You know, you certainly don't live in a gas field, so you definitely die in one. Well, Helen, um, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for um, coming on tonight. Don't run away. I've just got a couple of other uh, items that I want to cover, and then we'll come back um, before we finally go off air. Um, you know, in the UK, it's just been revealed, thanks to Russia Today, that uh, one of the PR agencies in this country, Bell Pottinger, has actually been producing fake terror videos to try to convince the uh, Western public that uh, Assad is the one committing atrocities, when any independent uh, and objective researcher knows very well what is occurring and that the uh, British and American and Israeli administrations are doing everything they can to ensure that uh, Assad ends up like Saddam Hussein and um, Gaddafi. So Bell Pottinger was revealed as manipulating on a budget of some $500 million, budgeting uh, for manipulating the media, so propaganda basically. Well, Bell Pottinger is the same PR company that is used by Quadrilla the company that is looking to drill and frack on the field. Meanwhile, Ineos paid for a Sun journalist to uh, take a trip out to Pennsylvania to show that uh, basically drilling saved Pittsburgh and it could do the same here. Uh, and you know, anyone, anyone who has done any research into this subject you know, could not read this article without actually falling off their chair either in 
uh, laughter or in absolute disbelief that somebody could be this ignorant uh, or this cognitive dissonant. But uh, then, of course, it depends on the size of the check that passed their way. So drilling saved Pittsburgh and it could do the same here. But what, of course, the author conveniently forgets or probably didn't even know because, you know, most um, journalists of the lamestream media are not capable of independent research. They're simply cut and paste merchants. Uh, but, uh, you know, some five years ago, over five years ago, Pittsburgh actually banned natural gas drilling because of fracking and the threat of fracking. And this is from the Huffington Post back in May of 2011, said the Pittsburgh City Council today unanimously adopted a first in the nation ordinance banning corporations for drilling for natural gas within city limits. A direct response to the threats to drinking water and public health posed by hydraulic fracturing methods used widely by drilling companies to extract natural gas from the Marcellus Shale. Pittsburgh City Council President Darlene Harris said her biggest concern about natural gas fracking involves the threat to people's health posed by water contamination by Marcellus drilling. She noted that the gas industry's claims about creating the thousands of jobs isn't worth the risk. They're bringing the jobs all right. There's going to be a lot of jobs for funeral homes and hospitals. That's where the jobs are. Is it worth it? Well, you know, such is the level of propaganda that um, uh, Goebbels would have been, I think, uh, well pleased with the efforts of the unconventional gas industry, uh, the magnitude of their lies, their deceit, their obfuscation, um, the level of cognitive dissonance. And I'm going to go one stage further and say that the bottom line is that anyone, anyone working in this industry uh, who still pretends that this is a safe industry and will not have any impact on the uh, environment uh, in any way, shape or form, regardless of regulations, uh, is basically a sociopath. The evidence is there for all to see. And as Helen has said, you know, the one thing that you will never hear the industry or the government say is please do your own research. Decide for yourself whether this is something that you want in your backyard. Over the last few episodes of Fracking Nightmare, we've had Brian Monk, we've had Rebecca LeBlanc from um, Texas, and tonight uh, Helen from um, just outside Chinchilla in southern Queensland. And these are but three people who have the courage to try to ensure that the rest of us do not have to suffer in the way that they have been made to suffer by an ignorant government and uh, an insidious and greedy industry. So Helen, any, uh, any final words for the people of the UK? Well, you could probably even go another step and, and suggest that uh, unconventional, onshore unconventional gas mining is a form of genocide. Um, because, you know, you, you look around Chinchilla here with the health impacts on their animals, not only the animal, like, the pigs, but we've got wingless birds here that are just neurologically have forgotten how to fly. That's not normal. Um, you know, the Condamine River and, you know, the, the quality of that water, um, radioactive levels, the lead, 210, the rest of the crap that's going in it. I mean, a river that looks blue can't be normal. So, you know, there's, there's obviously no... They're not concerned about their consequences. Um, and look, right, quite frankly, I've got absolutely nothing to gain from the industry. Um, so I'm just speaking as, as a girl that lives in Queensland who's just been impacted. So, you know, there's, there's no one paying me. I'm not getting threatened. And the other thing you've got you to gotta remember is I can't ask those pigs to act that way that they, that they do. Um, that's out of my control. Yeah, they're not crisis actors. <sighs> that, that's... No, no, they're not. And, and Ian, um, you know, yesterday morning we've got two sick pigs down there um, that um, I'm not game enough to do video. Whatever neurological issue that they've got, uh, I've never seen a pig jump a metre and a half to fling, him, fling himself across the, 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 the pen and up against walls. It's... It's, I suspect that when I go down there in the next 10 minutes, I'm either going to find another dead pig or um, he's still going to be, you know, he's got no idea where he is 
and there's no reason for for, for this pig. And this pig that has this neurological issue is in a different shed to the one that was on the video. So if you're saying that there's something in the piggery, well, there's there's no correlation between where the pigs are in their pens and when you know when they get sick. It's just very random. Well, the one thing that I don't think anybody in the UK will ever be able to claim is that they weren't warned. There weren't literally thousands of people trying to encourage communities to do their own research and take a look at what they would be embracing if this industry is permitted to roll into their community. This is a big week in the UK. What happens from this point forward is potentially down to all of us. Thanks for joining me. Thanks to Helen Bender and we'll see you next week.